Hi, so I thought I'd do a quick video about some of the possibly less obvious uses of serial decodes on scopes. One of the reasons for this is, um, and I've been using serial decode for a long time, so a few things I use it for are sort of fairly obvious to me, but I was um, doing some work at a customer's office a few months ago and we were deb debugging a fairly complicated system that had some sort of legacy software, so we weren't entirely sure what was going on, um, but we were sort of trying to build some hardware to interface to it. And I sort of just started sort of throwing in some serial debug stuff in there and sort of uh, the guy I was working with sort of like, oh, that, you know, that, that, that's an unusual use. I've not thought of that. So I thought maybe I'd uh, just cover this. So what I'm um, demonstrating this on, this is a um, just a little board. This is something I was messing about with, just really playing with some ideas. Don't really know where it's going. Um, it's a little ring of 64 LEDs. Um, this is actually wired up as an 8x8 matrix, just driven by um, a couple of shift register chips and a PIC24. So it's receiving data, serial data, and then just displaying it and you're doing um, software binary code modulation to get it to, to get a, a grayscale on it. So it's a fairly simple system, but there's a few aspects of this that are quite good for illustrating um, the various different ways of um, using serial debug. So starting off with the fairly obvious um, use, I'm sending this a string of image data and there's a few sort of parameters as well. So um, this is our incoming uh, received data line and this is the decode. This is being sent at 100k board. Incidentally, a lot of people just it seem to be stuck to these traditional board rates like 115, 2 and all this sort of stuff, but seeing as almost every serial port these days ends up going to a USB adapter, there really is no sensible, yeah, there, there isn't really good reason to keep using those rates. So, you know, I tend to stick to like nice powers of 8 or 10 for sort of things like RS485, I tend to, to use like 2 or 4 megaboard, that sort of thing. It also means you know you're you're less dependent on your know, weird oscillator frequencies and slight errors that you get when you're trying to do those board rates from a standard oscillator frequency. So basically, what what we've got here, we've got this, this sort of frame of uh, 64 bytes of image data, and there's a header there, and then say so the image data is starting there, about there, I think, and there's a few fixed parameters that I can change. So for example, here I'm just sort of adjusting this this byte value on the PC. Incidentally, um, one of the things. I don't particularly like about the serial decode on the Keysight scopes and also some of the Ag Agilent ones before, but the, the, the more recent Keysight ones are actually worse than this. If you actually look at how it displays the data, if we expand that just to show sort of pretty much a whole byte, it is smart enough to align it to show you exactly where the data is. Obviously, it's receiving you know, the start bit and then all the data bits. So the decode only knows what that value is when it hits there, but it is actually sort of effectively um, back annotating it to show exactly where whereabouts it's decoding, which is quite good. I've seen some decoders that don't do that quite as well. But the silly thing is, it does this sort of triangular end, so it, yeah, to make it look like a traditional you know, bus type timing diagram, which is really a bit unnecessary. And in fact, it's actually a, a distinct disadvantage because what happens is, as you start displaying more and more data, these curved corners actually start chopping off the data. So I mean, one issue you get is, for example, here, if you look at this zero, zero byte, as I actually shrink it down, you know, you can't now tell the difference. Is that a zero or is that a C? But also, you know, even at this sort of density, there, there's actually enough screen space to show those, but purely because they've got these silly you know, diagonal lines in there, it's just hiding data that you'd otherwise be able to see. It'd be much better if it just did it as a sort of rectangular box with a, a, ver a vertical separator. They could probably also use a slightly smaller font size. So the, um, the old, my old MSO 6034, that had a slightly higher res screen and that did use slightly smaller characters, but it did stuff from the, from the same issue about this bus thing, but that's a, say a minor irritation. But Now, when you're debugging particularly real-time systems and interrupt code, you know, conventional debuggers really fall flat because you know, they involve stopping the system, and of course you just can't do that. So if, you're, if you've done any this sort of work, you're probably fairly familiar with this technique. So what I've done here is I've just made it toggle a spare I open whenever it receives a character. So you can actually then see you know, the fact that it is receiving characters, it's not missing any out. So you get like an immediately sort of time correlated debug information. You can also see, for example, this is actually doing the serial uh, receive in foreground mode. So you can see we've got a bit of time jitter there based on whereabouts in the loop it is when it, when it um, detects it. So you know, this is a very useful technique for getting relative timing information, especially when you're doing th things like debugging interrupt code and so on. And I'm sure, you know, it's a fairly common technique. Obviously that has limitations. Firstly, you know, you need to have a spare eye open and you can sort of generally only show sort of one thing at once. Quite often you want to show, you know, more than just, you know, I, all this is really saying is yeah, I'm here. What you quite often want to know is, well, I'm here, but you maybe want to actually get some visibility into other parts of the system. 
as you've got serial decode, what you can do is instead of just toggling an I.O. line, you can throw data out of a UART transmit pin. Now, in this case, I'm running at the same same board rate. So th this is, again, still debugging a serial stream, but it really needn't, needn't be. This is sort of a fairly general purpose technique, and I'll, I'll go on to that in, in a second. So what I'm doing now is whenever I receive a byte, I'm transmitting... It, it's taking that data and it's sticking into a receive buffer. What I'm now doing is I'm transmitting the pointer into that buffer so we can see our incoming data. But what we, what we can see on this second stream, let's just flip these the other way around so they're, they're the right way around on screen. The second thing is telling me where in that buffer that data is going. So obviously that's you know, potentially very useful information. It also tells me, for example, you know, that, that it's stopping at the right place, we're getting the right number of bytes in there. So that, 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 that's a sort of very simple example. But yeah, this same technique works on systems that just aren't even using serial at all. If we now take a look at the, um, the interrupt timing for the display stuff, we can see that exactly the same technique can be used to prov provide you know, useful insight into what's going on in real time, correlated with other, for example, let, let's say an, uh, an input signal or something like that. Right, so let's take a look at something that's completely non-coms related and see how the um, serial bus decode can actually really help us producing debug data. This is doing some intensity modulation to um, get to get grayscaling on the uh, LEDs and it's driving, it's an 8x8 multiplex, so it's 8 rows and 8 columns. So what we're seeing here is this is the enable signal um, for the drivers so that it outputs all the most significant bits, enables for, it for this amount of time then the next lower bits then enables it for half the time so that within those pulses we end up with by the end of this we've turned the leads on the number of um, bit times that we want depending on the required intensity and what this bottom trace is showing is the interrupt what I've done is I've set up I just add the flag that sets this line high whenever it's inside the interrupt code so what happens is our row timer sets off an interrupt and within this interrupt we do a certain amount of setting up so it's sort of moderately long time it's about uh, let's say about 10 microseconds and then it basically uses the output compare hardware to generate this pulse length and then when it's finished it generates an interrupt and that interrupt then sets up the next the next the next length so whenever this is high yeah we're inside an interrupt routine again that yeah this is a fairly common way of debugging this stuff here yeah, because this thing is happening in, in real time you know you can't just be sort of printing stuff to a terminal or anything you've got to really know, see exactly what's going on we've actually got two interrupts going on here we've got the, the row interrupt here and the you know the, the, this compare interrupt happening here but I've, uh, for convenience i've just used the same pin to indicate both interrupts now obviously we could use different pins to show the different interrupts but also again you know all we're saying is yeah i am here now what we may want to to do is get get out, get a bit more information out of it. So what I've done now is I've set I've set up another channel on the um, the UART transmitter, and what this is doing this is actually outputting the row number that it's currently working on. So if we now turn the serial decode on, we can now see now this is cycling through because this is triggering sort of on every uh, roughly every other row because we've got some trigger hold off going on. If I just turn the take turn that hold off down. We should then we, see we're now triggering on every row. So when we stop, we can actually see, yeah, not only is this row data, but we know which row it is. And obviously this is running through a cycle of eight. And again, what we can do is this is also handy for triggering in that, well, okay, we've now got a row number. So what we can actually now do is set up a trigger on the serial thing. So we can now trigger data is equal zero. So what this will do now, what we're doing now is we're actually triggering only on row zero. So we can actually now see our whole cycle of eight displays but but it's all in the same place and of course we can actually yeah, now start to show sort of more complex data so for each frame it's actually outputting data um, from a, b a buffer of pre-calculated values to handle the uh, grayscale modulation so now what I'm doing is on each row I'm now actually sending the pointer to that buffer so yeah let's say our display is looking garbled and we want to figure out what's going on we can now see where it's actually getting the data from in each row. Instead, you'll see that's going zero, 9 rather than 8 because we're actually doing 9 bits of grayscaling here. So it's actually doing 9 of these pulses um, on each row, which is why that's saying 9, 9, 1, 2, and so, yeah, slightly less obvious uh, value. So yeah, now we can see that for each row, where's that data coming from? So you can actually get some, some quite sophisticated information out of this. Now, another issue to think about is, well, quite often, you know, you can extend this. Well, maybe you want, we want to get more than one byte of data out at each time. Well, 
Um, one nice thing about UARTs is that they've quite often got more than one byte of buffering. Now, what you don't, obviously what you don't want to do in your debug code is add any code that sits there waiting for this thing to be transmitted. You, know, you don't want to store your code, you don't want to slow it down, because the whole point of debugging is trying to you know, debug a system working the way it should work. So, you know, you don't do the traditional, you know, send it to the UART and then wait for the UART to be ready. You just throw it at the UART and hope it's fast enough, and obviously, you, you know, you range so that it is. But, even on an 8-bit micro, there's generally two bytes of buffering. You know, if you send a byte to the UART, that generally starts transmitting, and it's usually got a, a second register, so you can typically send, throw two bytes at it, and it will display both of those two bytes. So, for example, now what I'm doing, I'm sending both the row number and, the, and that buffer address. So we can sort of just go through and we can see, okay, row three, you know, that address is correct, and that, yeah, for, as, as debugging tool, that, that, that's really handy. And um, as you get to 16 and 32 bit uh, micros, they've quite often got FIFOs on the UART, so you can typically send between 8 and 16 bytes without having to do any handshaking. And of course, if the thing you're looking at is happening sort of too fast, you can, you know, you've can you usually got the option to speed the board rate up. So this is only going at um, 100 cable, because that just happened to be the board rate I was using for the comms. But because we're now not doing really anything to do with the comms, we can just make the board rate whatever is convenient for to display nicely. Set the um, board rate to 2 megaboard. And yeah, again, most micros, yeah, even at yeah, PIX and AVRs will quite often happily do one megaboard. So now yeah, the time to send our debug data is really, really short. So it means that we, yeah, we can actually send it more frequently. Now, there is one issue, obviously, if you're trying to get an overview, if you're literally you know, trying to say get an overview of a few cycles here, sending it that fast doesn't actually make any sense because we can't actually see the data because it's too squashed up on the on the scope. But so obviously, you know, it's worth playing around adjusting the board rate to be a, a, around the same scale. But where this does make sense is, let's say, for example, we actually want to look at each one of these interrupts. Then, obviously, we're looking at a much uh, smaller scale, so a uh, faster board rate is more appropriate. OK, I've now changed this so that on the row interrupt, it gives us our row number and the um, output pointer. But I'm now also sending out on each of these compare interrupts. Again, I'm sending the pointer so we can actually see the address that that data is being sent from. And again, now, because we're at a much smaller scale, it now makes more sense to be sending it to Megaboard because you know, our data is coming at a similar sort of rate to the um, our interrupt. So you know, by just changing that board rate, you know, you can scale things quite nicely. And I'm not that familiar with serial decodes on other scopes. It was then Agilent first out brought out serial decode on their scopes. It only did like fairly standard rates, like 115 to 96, 92, etc. But fairly soon they realised that yeah, that didn't make sense. So nowadays you've pretty much got a fair, got a fairly wide range of speed so for example on um the yeah the key site range generally it will go it goes up to i think eight megaboard and i think you can actually there is actually a, te a fixed 10 meg megaboard setting and again certainly a lot of those 32-bit processors will do that sort of board rate but obviously to some extent you're limited by your processor but obviously an important aspect of serial debug is that you know it, it, you don't just get this list you get you know whatever you want as well because you may have a weird clock rate or you may want to send be, may want to send stuff out um quickly Another thing to remember is most serial decodes, certainly for UART, are based on two-way communication. So gen you, you, you've generally got two separate channels. So for example here, you know, you set up separate channels for RX and TX. So here, here I'm using channel 2 and the X channel. So we've effectively got effectively two completely separate debug streams. And what I'm doing now is on the row interrupt I'm sending the row number and the pointer to one UART. And I'm sending in the compare interrupt. I'm sending the the pointer in the into the second jar. Obviously, this relies on having two UARTs on the chip. And again, yeah, you know, certainly most 32-bit um, and up micros have multiple UARTs. So you know, if you've got those multiple UARTs, it means that you can. So, for example, now I know that this is my row interrupt and this is my compare interrupt. So again, you can show sort of two independent streams of data. Um, on this scope, it's only got one decode channel, so they both have to be the same board rate. On the, the 3000X series, you can actually set up two decodes running at different board rates, which can sometimes be handy. So we could actually set this up so that we actually sort, yeah, we could actually scale these to be more sensible. So we, we could zoom in on things and have both of them appear at sensible width. But even with, I mean, yeah, th obviously this, yeah, this applies to any scope that has a serial decode, but also some of the, there's quite a lot of the uh, low cost logic analyzers also have serial decode. So yeah, this technique applies to all of those. In the, basically don't just think about serial decoders a way of decoding serial protocols thinking about it you know i can do like a real-time printf onto my scope trace and see exactly what things are in hard real time which is yeah i, I think i probably use it for this more than i use it for serial comms decoding it's just so useful now of course you might not have a spare uart available and there's, there's a couple of ways around this one of one simple way is you can just do a very simple bit bash to uart again if you're outputting at say one or two megaboard 
yeah, just a very tight loop. You can quite easily get to one to two mega board as long as you've got fairly consistent timing and you're not getting interrupted. The other, the other option um, is to use Spy instead of UART. There's advantages and disadvantages. The nice thing about Spy is it's self-clocking. So let's say, for example, you're spitting data out of a foreground task. It doesn't matter if you're getting interrupted because, OK, it will take longer for that Spy value to come out, but it will still be correct. With hardware Spy, obviously, it's simple. Yeah, you may have a spare Spy port available you can just use, no problem. If you, you know, if you don't have the hardware, if maybe you're, you're using a really low-end microid, you, you just don't have the um, resources available, you can do a, a software bit bash spy and that, that will work just, yeah, just fine. So here I'm just using a simple software spy, um, like six lines of code, and that's spitting out um, 16 bits. One nice thing about spy is that quite often they support other than 8-bit words. So here I'm actually sending 16 bits. And to minimise the, um, the number of lines I'm using, I'm just using clock and data. The framing, I'm using the timeout. Now again, I don't know how commonly implemented this is, this is on um, other scopes, but basically as well as using a chip selector to decide how long the frame is, on the Keysight ones you can s select a clock timeout. So basically it assumes that this is set to like 48 microseconds. So basically 48 microseconds after the last clock, it assumes, okay, that's it, that's the end of our word. Now obviously that's, that's producing quite a large frame on screen. I'm just transmitting and incrementing 16-bit number here, incidentally. But if I, obviously I could just change that and, and trim that down. So as I reduce that time out, you can see that it knows that how big the, the word is. But so the nice thing about um, Spy, if you have to do something bit bashed, if you don't have the hardware peripherals, I'm now sort of sending some data that's actually causing this process to get interrupted. So you can see the actual time is jittering because sometimes partway through sending this, we're getting interrupted and it's taking longer. But even when that's happening, we're always getting the right number of clocks and this information is always correct. So that, that wouldn't be the case if we were doing a bit bashed UART. Um, obviously it's not an issue for using a hardware peripheral, but say it's purely if you're having to bit bash it because you, you, you're out of resources, then um, that's, yeah, that's another good way. Obviously with Spy you're using an extra channel, both on the, um, your micro and also on the, uh, the scope. But uh, it's just an alternative way. But yeah, UART will be the normal way of doing it, and if you don't have a, a physical UART to, um, to use. Um, so I hope uh, anyone that hadn't previously thought of that is sort of now realises that um, serial decode is not just about comms. It's you know it's a general purpose debugging tool. Even if you're you know not even doing hardware, if you, you know it's like you know real time printf down to the last few microseconds. Um, visibility and you know debugging is all about visibility really. You know, figuring out exactly what your system's doing, why it's doing it. And yeah, there's tons more examples. I mean, one one example I thought of that it's not actually applicable to PICs, but other processors. For example, let's say you've got this a situation where the thing just an interrupt causes a crash once in a blue moon. What you could do, for example, is your interrupt code could maybe pull the return address off the stack, spit it out the serial port, so that you can see on a scope, yeah, some sequence of events, and you could actually look at you know, where that interrupt occurred in the main code. It, you, know, you maybe set up a trigger event that triggers when the thing crashes and you could actually look at that, the address that it came from, so you can figure out, okay, when this interrupt code happens at this point in the main code, yeah, that, that, that's the problem. And again, you know, just things like, you know, verifying that buffer addresses are right, things are coming from the same places and so on. Just the ability to get, you know, numeric data instantaneously from any part of your code is just amazingly useful. And of course, serial trigger can be, yeah, be equally useful in that you can often set up conditions. So let's say, for example, you, you had an interrupt code and you were spitting out the, uh, an address pointer. Let's say, for example, you're outputting a buffer pointer and you can set a trigger, say a greater than trigger. So this, for example, it's that, that value is going higher than it should do. Again, you can trigger on that and, and try and figure out exactly, um, exactly what's going on. And the nice thing about it is, okay, you know, a lot of that stuff you can do in your code, but Sometimes that sort of thing, you know, you actually have to put extra bits in the code to do that. Whereas if you're just throwing all this data out, it means you can very quickly select what you're interested in, find out what's going on without having to iterate changing your code. It means that, let you, for example, you're looking for specific values, you can trigger on, you know, and for exa other examples, for example, let's say you've got lots of interrupts going on. Maybe what you could do is you could spit out a byte value to tell at the start of each, in each interrupt code to identify which interrupt code is executing. And again, you know, you just see an immediate display, you know, which interrupt is happening when and again you could trigger on a specific interrupt and um, yeah, you really get straight into what you actually want to see so it can be a, a real massive time saver.